In this video, we'll solve another linear algebra problem related to the deflection of three columns. Here we have a bridge and three columns acting to bear the load P. P is applied downward some distance D from the left end of the bridge. When P is applied, each column experiences either a tensile or compressive force depending on where along the bridge P acts. These three equations govern the force in each column. What's more interesting is the deflection of each column given by this equation here. Structural engineers are concerned about the deflection because some materials behave poorly when stretched or compressed too much. For example, many bridge supports, like the three columns you see in the problem, are made out of concrete. Concrete is strong when compressed but has notoriously bad tensile strength and cracks very easily under tension. Even though concrete is very strong under compression, too much compression will cause buckling. Therefore, it's important to make sure that P does not cause the columns to shrink or stretch too much. The premise of the problem is to solve the linear system to find the forces in each column, then plug in the forces into the deflection equation and analyze the system from there. This problem contains many static parameters, such as P, E, and A. Due to the sheer number of parameters, I compiled them into a .mat file, which can be found in the video description. Download the .mat file to your working directory, load it using the given command here, and the six parameters should appear in the workspace. We'll do this in a little bit. Let's go ahead and get started with part A, which wants us to arrange the first three equations into matrix form. Here I've copied the three equations from the problem statement. Thankfully, these equations are already pretty orderly. Each row contains the three forces in the same order, so now it's just a matter of separating out the coefficients. The coefficients in the first row are all 1. The coefficients in the second row are 10, 28, and 40, and the coefficients in the last row are 12 times LAB, negative 30 times LCD, and 18 times LGF. The three L's are considered coefficients too because they represent physical constants. The X vector will be comprised of FAB, FCD, and FGF. And finally, the B vector will consist of negative P, negative D times P, and zero. Let's go ahead and fill this in in the template. Be sure to check all your minus signs. Now that we have the A, X, and B matrices, we can go ahead and plug this into MATLAB. Here we are in the blank script file. Before we write the function, I'll load the .mat file into the script and also make another variable that we'll use as an input to the function. The first line loads all the various constants from the .mat file. Make sure that the .mat file is in your working directory, otherwise this code will not run. I also made the L variable, which is a vector containing the three column lengths. All three of these column lengths are contained within the .mat file. We'll use the L vector in our function. Speaking of the function, let's scroll down to the bottom and write the function header. The function is named force deflection and it accepts five inputs. All five of these inputs are physical constants. Remember that L is a vector and the other four inputs are all scalars. The outputs are F, which is a vector containing the three forces, and delta, which is a vector containing the three deflections. See this pre-written documentation for more details. Let's go ahead and input the A, X, and B matrices and also compute the deflections of each of the columns. I labeled the A matrix coefs to avoid confusion with the constant A. 
Also, I call it the x vector f because I think f is a more contextually suitable variable name. To compute the deflections, I dot multiplied the f and l vectors and divided by the product of e and a according to the formula in the problem statement. You need to dot multiply f and l because each of these variables are three element vectors. This means that delta also has three elements, which is what we want. It's good practice to test the force deflection function individually using a few simple test cases. One of the cases you can test is the zero case. If p equals zero, then there shouldn't be any forces or deflections in any of the columns. I'll leave the testing for you to do on your own. Now, we'll repeatedly call that function to understand how the forces and deflections of each column change when we move the location of the point force along the length of the bridge. Before we do that, we need to declare and pre-allocate some variables. The length of the bar, or the bridge, depending on what you want to call it, is 50 meters, which you can confirm from the image in the problem statement. The d vector will go from 0 to the bar length. A step size of 1 meter is sufficiently small for this problem, although you are always welcome to make the step size more granular. The f matrix contains 3 rows and 51 columns. This is where we'll store the three forces for each d value. When d equals 0, the three column forces will be stored in the first column. When d equals 1, the forces will be stored here, and so forth. The delta matrix does the exact same thing, except obviously it stores the displacements instead of the forces. Now let's write a for loop to fill the f and delta matrices one column at a time using our force deflection function. We called the force deflection function using the ith element in the d vector. The resulting forces and deflections will be placed in the ith columns of the f and delta matrices, respectively. If we go to the workspace, we can see that we populated the delta and the f matrices with non-zero numbers. This should clue us in that we did something correctly. Instead of looking at a bunch of numbers and matrices, let's plot this. Part d wants us to plot the forces on one subplot and the deflections on another subplot. I already wrote the code, so all you have to do is uncomment it and run it. The plot shows some pretty interesting trends. If we look at FAB, we see that it starts out negative and becomes positive around d equals 35 meters. That means up until about 35 meters, you're pressing down on the column, so the deflection should be negative, which it is. After 35 meters, the force becomes positive, so the column is in tension and the deflection is positive as well. FGF follows an opposite trend. It starts out positive, so we start by pulling up on the column, and we can see that the deflection is positive. The force, and therefore the deflection, become negative shortly after d equals 15 meters. Meanwhile, FCD is always negative, so the column will always be in compression. It's interesting how the direction of the force can switch depending on d. The deflection subplot also has some interesting trends. First, the magnitude of the deflections is incredibly small compared to the magnitudes of the forces. The forces are about 7 orders of magnitude larger than the deflections. Going back to the deflection equation, the product E times A is going to be a really, really, really big number, mostly due to E itself being gargantuan. Even though the forces themselves are pretty big, E times A is much bigger, which is why the deflections turn out so small. In an engineering context, the deflections of a load-bearing column are hopefully very small compared to the load itself. Now let's turn to the shape of the lines. In general, the shapes of all three lines are the same between both subplots. This should make sense because the deflection is just a scaled version of the force. You should also notice that the lines cross zero at the same d locations in both subplots. This aligns with the notion that switching from a positive to a negative force physically means that the column switches from being stretched to being compressed, or vice versa. 
Interestingly, all three columns deflect the same amount around d equals 27 meters. Now let's do part E, which relates to a safety standard. Part E wants us to compare the deflections to a threshold delta max. The safety standard indicated in the problem states that the deflection of any column should never surpass delta max. But as we can see from the plot, sometimes the standard is violated. For small values of d, the deflection of column gf exceeds delta max. For large values of d, column ab violates the standard. This means that we cannot compute the factor of safety. Instead, we have to determine over which d's the standard is met. Just from looking at the plot, we can see that the standard is only met from about d equals 7 to 42-ish meters. Let's see if we can confirm that using some code. The delta is less than delta max expression returns a 3 by 51 logical matrix. An individual entry within that logical matrix is 1 if that entry is less than delta max and 0 otherwise. I'll copy and paste this expression into a dummy variable and we can examine it in the workspace. We want to find the locations where all three deflections are below the threshold. When that happens, all the entries in a given column will be 1. Therefore, when the sum of any individual column is 3, that means all three deflections are under the max. For instance, we see here that the eighth column of this matrix all contains ones, so we know that all three columns in this particular location do not violate the standard. If we go back to the code, the standard met variable is a 1 by 51 logical array indicating these locations. We can examine standard met in the workspace as well. Here we see that the eighth element of the standard met vector is one. This corresponds to the dummy variable where we can see that the 8th column of the dummy matrix has all 1s as well. We use the standard met variable to index the d vector. This way, the d values which meet the standard are kept in the d allow vector. The fprintf output tells us that the standard is only met from 7 to 42 meters, which matches with the plot. Finally, part E wants us to analyze our results. It's abundantly clear that the safety standard isn't always met. What can we do to remedy this? Well, we could start by decreasing the load, p. A smaller load obviously doesn't stress the columns as much. We could also use a stiffer material. In other words, we could find a material with a higher modulus of elasticity. A material with a higher E value won't deflect nearly as much as a material with a lower E value. We can also increase the cross-sectional area of each column. It's easier to compress a slender item than a widespread item. Think of an upright linguine noodle and a flat lasagna noodle. If you press down with the same force on both noodles, the linguine noodle will bend and will probably snap, but the lasagna noodle is more durable. Mathematically, we have three options to decrease the deflection of each column. In reality, not every option is viable. For instance, perhaps the load cannot be altered, or you have to use a very specific material with a specific modulus of elasticity. Regardless of practicality, it's always good to know what options you have from understanding the mathematical model. To recap, this video solved a linear algebra problem pertaining to the compression and tension of load-bearing columns on a bridge. We saw how the columns reacted to where the load on the bridge is applied. This involved taking some equations, converting them to AX equals B form, and doing more MATLAB coding to analyze the results. See you next time.